Amen. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. What's our goal? 10,000. What's our goal? 10,000. How much are we going to raise? 10,000. 11,000. Okay. They said 11,000. Thank you all so much for contributing to our IMB missionaries as Holly has challenged us. Uh, the WMU has challenged us. If we all participate, we will succeed. Many hands make light work. If we all do a little something, God will get us there. Thank you for being here this morning. Your beautiful church. Jordan, you did a beautiful job. Thank you. Wasn't that nice? It's not because it's my daughter-in-law, although I am proud of her. But she's just such a gifted young singer. We are blessed, church. Do you realize that? We are a blessed people. Do you feel blessed? God has blessed us. As we uh, come into these holidays, just think about the tables we've been eating from. (laughs) Thank you, Sunday school class last night. Man, what a beautiful fellowship dinner we had. How many of you made it to the fellowship dinner last night at John and Julie Welburn's? Raise your hand. Hey, was that good? We had a Mexican meal with the best Mexican food, top of the line, that I've probably ever had. His Texas caviar is off the charts. Ask him for, for uh, it's a secret recipe. Actually, don't ask him for the recipe. Ask him to fix it for you. <laughs> there you go. And by the way, we're using that for our uh, new members class. And I want to invite you, even if you hadn't been, I know we have... Uh, uh, currently three families we're going to eat. We've got, uh, I hate to tell you this, it's got leftovers. But it's the best leftovers there is. It's out of this world. And I know uh, um, uh, we got uh, at least two or three families that are coming. If you'd like to come to our new members class, I want to invite you. Uh, we have plenty. And so uh, plan on just right after service, making your way to the fellowship hall. I'll finish greeting and I'll meet you all to eat around 1 o'clock. With that being said, I want to turn your minds to the Scripture, and I want to take you to the Old Testament. If you would please turn to the prophet Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And I I want to challenge you, if you have, how many of you, and I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but how many of you have a Facebook account? Raise your hand. Raise it high. All right. How many of you have shared our Facebook live stream? Pretty good. I see some hands that didn't go up that has Facebook. Here's what we want to do. We want to spread this message as far as we can, right? Just like I had somebody yesterday Facebook message me saying, please share this. I want it to go viral. Here's what I would say about the gospel. Please share this. I want it to go viral. We will use the tools that God has given us to share the gospel. And so, if you haven't uh, shared our feed, please do that. And thank you guys in the sound room for doing what you're doing. It's making a difference. I saw a lot of chatter on this past week's feed. People asking, where is Crestview Baptist Church? Uh, We're on 3258 Pisgah Drive, Canton, North Carolina. We are glad... And we are so glad you're watching by live stream. We welcome you. We are here to serve. We're here to preach the gospel. And I'm going to be in the ninth chapter of Isaiah this morning. I'm going to unpack this short passage, but powerful passage from Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 and 7. If you'd take your Bibles with me, turn, and we will look at God's Word together. Isaiah chapter 9, and beginning in verse 6. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. There's no comma there. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over His kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from this time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's pray together, church. Lord, we join our hearts together in, in the Word and around the Word as we look unto heaven, Lord, and look unto Jesus. Father, may we look unto Jesus and not only be saved, but look unto Jesus and find refreshment, find encouragement, find strength, find sustaining grace. God, we want to look at you this Christmas and see Jesus. We want to see a portrait of the Son, the child that was given. We want to see in all your dynamic glory, we want to catch a glimpse of you. And God, I ask you this morning to pour, crack open the portals of our understanding and bring us into the heavenlies to see this marvelous, beautiful picture of Christ the Son. Thank you, Lord for the gospel, that it is powerful and it is given for our salvation, that I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and the Greek and for everyone who believes. And Lord, I pray that everyone will believe that here's my voice. In Jesus' name I pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. What is Christmas about? Christmas is about one thing person, Jesus. That's why we're here. I was reading an interesting uh, sermon from a, I have a lot of resources that I try to read and prepare, and, and it was a it was very interesting sermon this guy gave on why Christmas, because I'm going to be speaking, by the way, if you're a senior adult, I want to invite you to Joyful Hearts tomorrow morning. We're going to be here, and I'm going to be speaking on why Christmas. So we will we'll share a wonderful meal together, but we're going to be talking about why Christmas. But in, in preparing for that, this guy was giving all the reasons uh, why people say we should not celebrate Christmas. And there's a number of reasons. Number one, it was a pagan holiday. Another, no, number two, the tree is idolatrous worship, Jeremiah 10. And there were a number of reasons. But ultimately what he said was, this, that Christmas is about Jesus Christ. It's not about any idolatrous worship. It's not about uh, any other uh, tree worship or any uh, distraction. It's about Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is. In fact, uh, it was celebrated by the early church. At some point, they began to celebrate Christ Mass. And so we take this passage, and we're going to dissect it in detail and look at the portrait of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And I've entitled this message, A Portrait of the Son. How does the prophet Isaiah describe the Messiah? I'm going to give you six descriptions for the Messiah. He begins by saying, For unto us... A child is born. So number one, the Messiah will be a tender child. This is very important. Could God have sent a full-grown adult to the earth? Yes. But God did not choose to send a full-grown adult to the earth. He chose to send a baby. He chose to send a child, a son, a tender child. It's exactly what the... Prophet said in Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. By the way, the Greek version of that makes no doubt about that. That's a virgin. A young woman never been with a man. The virgin shall conceive, and she shall bring forth a son. It's a child. We see in hints of this throughout Isaiah. Isaiah reads like a New Testament book. This kid that is born, it looks like other kids. But his name shall be called Emmanuel, for God is with us. 
Isaiah 49 says, Listen, old coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. He's made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me like a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. In other words, the prophet foresees this child being called from the mother's womb. That he is being born of a virgin, this little child. And we see in Luke 126 uh, an allusion to that. When, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, Mary, blessed are you among women. God's favor is on you. And the angel Gabriel said, get, I'm going to give you my version. Get ready, Mary. You're about to have a baby. Now, wait a minute. Mary's engaged, but is she married? No. She says, I have a technical question. And here's what the angel said. Listen. The angel said, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you and you shall conceive and you'll bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Jesus. From his mother's womb. His name would even be mentioned according to Isaiah. And he would grow up before the Lord as a child. Just like Isaiah 53 said, as I was meditating over this in the night. This verse came to me in my back of my archives that, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant. That's how Jesus was going to grow up as a tender plant before the Lord, as a... A boy, an ordinary looking child, like a tender child. By the way, children are tender. Sidebar, when you get older, you should get be be better parents, right? By the time you get to be grandparents, you should be even better, correct? Amen? Amen? That's right. Because we learn, but children are tender. We need to learn how to parent our children with loving parameters. That's a, by the way, young parents... If you have any questions, just call me. I'll see what I can do to answer. <laughs> I have a li- some limited experience with that. But this child is a tender child growing up before the Lord from his mother's womb, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in Luke 2, this ordinary looking child, when they performed all things, Mary and Joseph, according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. I've seen it right there on the hillside. That hillside, that little tiny village at the time, it's bigger now. And the Bible says, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He was a little boy that grew, and nobody but his mom and dad knew what was going on. Even his own siblings didn't know. And in Luke 2.52, the Bible says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. In other words, he grew up. How many of you were here 10 years ago when we came? Raise your hand. Do you remember my youngest child, Joel? Has he increased in stature? Yes, he has. Stand up, Joel. No, I'm teasing. Don't stand up. (laughs) No, don't stand up. He's pushing 6'5 now. He's outstripped us all. He's taller than me and his brothers. Jesus grew from a little boy to a young man. And we see him in the temple at 12 years old, arguing with the teachers of the law, bringing irrefutable wisdom upon him. This is the tender child that the prophet Isaiah, almost 800 years prior, spoke about. He is the Messiah, Mashiach. Jesus, the Christ. All the prophetic statements from the Old Testament are fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. Not only was he a tender child, number two, his name, he's been given four names by the prophet. I'm going to unpack those for you. The Messiah will be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Now hold on, I'm going to roll with this because this is so rich. This is the kind of character that this child was going to have and this king would have. The word wonderful in the passage literally means incomprehensible. 
The Messiah will cause us to be full of wonder. The word is much weightier than the way it's used in normal conversation. Today we say things are wonderful if they're pleasant, if they're are lovely, or if they're good eating. It's wonderful. We've had wonderful... But this is a different way the word is used in the original language. It's, it's in a way that wonderful was spoke about when Samson was announced to be born. If you remember back in Judges 13, the Bible says that Manoah was there. And the angel of the Lord, by the way, in Judges, the angel of the Lord is who? Jesus appears, pre-incarnate Jesus. And said, you're going to have a son. He's going to be a Nazarite. And then dad's saying, hey, that's, that's incredible. But what, what is your name? And the pre-incarnate form of Jesus says, why do you ask what my name is? Seeing that it is wonderful. Full of wonder. In other words, he's saying, why do you ask my name? This is beyond your understanding. Wonderful. He demonstrated this in incredible ways. Of course, he was born as a... Conceived miraculously in Mary's womb from a virgin. He had amazing power to heal. He taught. He raised the dead from life. He himself was resurrected from the dead. And he preached and taught counterintuitive, amazing principles just like blessed. He said, are you, uh, when you're persecuted, because then you're going to have a reward in heaven. Love your enemies. How counterintuitive is that? Love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. It's awesome and it's wonderful. He was amazing. He was wonderful. The Bible says, and, and uh, Isaiah uses this word again in twenty-eight, twenty-nine to describe the Lord, saying, this also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. He's not only wonderful, but he's a counselor. He's a wise counselor. He's beyond what a human counselor is. In Christ are all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He is our heavenly counselor. Hey, and he's right there too. He is our wonderful counselor. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says... Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him in what? He shall direct your paths. He'll guide you. He is a wonderful counselor. Number three, the Messiah will be called Mighty God. Not only wonderful counselor, but He'll be called Mighty God. What does that mean? Let me just unpack it in brief. Mighty God means it is God himself born in human flesh. I preached on the mystery of the incarnation that this child that was born is mighty God. There's some argument about that, as I touched on last week. A certain group, in fact, Jehovah's Witnesses being one, say that the Messiah is not really God. He's not really called God. Uh, that, that mighty God is different than almighty God. And ultimately, that he is not God. But let me give you uh, a very clear biblical statement that when we look at this under close examination of the Scriptures, we're going to see that mighty God is almighty God. And Jesus is God. Isaiah 43.10 says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. And that word in Hebrew is Yahweh, declares Yahweh. And my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe, there it is, same invitation as John, that you may know him and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed and there will be none after me. There's not but one God, Yahweh. The word for God in, is in a simple Hebrew El, the most basic word for God, and the same word used of the Messiah in Isaiah 9, 6. If Jesus is the Messiah... He is the mighty God, or the El Gabor. And He is to be called upon as such. But there's no other true living God besides Yahweh. There is no El but He and His people are surely not to call on a false God. 
Thus, Isaiah 9, 6 is clear that mighty God on whom they are to call is Yahweh and not some lesser God that would be by definition a false God since there's only one true God. And then Isaiah says this, Now in that day, 10 verse 20, the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, but will truly rely on the Lord, which is Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. Who are they returning to? To the Lord, Yahweh, the one true God of Israel. Here, in the text, he's called El Gabor. The same word as we got right here in 9-6. He is Almighty God. Jesus, Messiah, is the mighty God. It reminds me of one of my favorite verses, Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God in your midst. By the way, is He in our midst? He is. God is in our midst. The Lord your God... I'm, the mighty one, El Gabor, who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will rejoice over you with what? S singing. El Gabor. Yahweh is almighty God. And Jesus is mighty God. He is who we're to call on. He is our eternal Savior, and He is Yahweh God. Number four, the Messiah will be called Everlasting Father. Everlasting Father. It can be translated Father of Eternity. And some have suggested this means that the coming Messiah is also the creator of everything. He's the Father of time and eternity. The architect of the ages. While we know this to be true from... Uh, Colossians 1, 16 and 7, this is really not the emphasis right here. Here in the Hebrew, Father is the primary noun, and everlasting is the term that describes His fatherhood. What does that mean, He is the everlasting Father? It means that the everlasting is without end. It's in perpetuity. That means He is Father without end. Eternal, everlasting. There's no end. You get, we're going to get excited right here. How long is eternity? Let's wrap our minds around that one for a minute. That's a long time. The, the son who would be born, the child who was given, would be the everlasting father forever and ever and ever, in this fatherhood, some have complained about this messing up the idea of the Trinity, but that, it really doesn't because he's not speaking in terms of the Trinity right here. What he's speaking about is the idea of the father of, like, George Washington. He's known as what? The father of the country, right? He was the one who protected. He was the one who led the country by his determination and leadership that brought victory in the Revolutionary War. He's the father. He helped build the U.S. Constitution. Washington, in some sense, is the father of the United States of America. In ancient times, the father of the nation was viewed in the same way as the father of a family. It was the father who was to protect and provide for his children. In the same way, this child to be born would become a king who would be a father to the children of Israel. He would protect and provide for them. And his role as protector and provider would not be limited by aging or by death. His role as our protector and our provider will continue forever and ever. He is our everlasting Father. The full identity of Christ, God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity, the, the soon coming King who's going to rule for a thousand years will be worked out in the New Testament. Well, here we're getting a glimpse of his eternality, of his being, of his identity, who he is. He's the father of all Israel and all believers.
Number five, the Messiah will be called Prince of Peace. The Hebrew word right here is what? Shalom. Shalom. How many of you heard that word? Shalom. Let me, let me unpack that for you in case you had not heard that word. It's still being used today. Shalom is used in reference to an appearance of calm and tranquility of individuals, groups, and nations. The Greek word in the New Testament's uh, irene, which is uh, unity and accord, but also means it's translate peace. So Paul uses uh, irene to describe the objective of the New Testament church, but the deeper, more foundational meaning of shalom is the spiritual harmony brought about by an individual's restoration with God. In other words, the peace that he, the Prince of Peace is going to bring is between us and God. What are we apart from salvation in God? We're separated. In fact, Ephesians 2 says we are enemies. We are enemies. How many of you were atheists before you became a believer? I know we got one. He just told me a, a fragment of his testimony. Like some little old lady that was praying for me, he almost hung up on her. You know what the Prince of Peace does? He works miracles to bring us back into peace with the Father that created us. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The Scripture is so clear. I love Romans, the book of Romans, and we, we are enemies when we're separated from God and we don't even know that we're enemies. But Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. How are we made peace with God? Through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. That's how we have peace with God. This is a deep abiding peace between our heart and our Creator's heart. You can't take it away. Jesus said, my peace I give. Not as the world gives. It's a supernatural peace. It's a peace that you can't buy with money. It's a peace that's worth more than any money in the world. When your soul is right with your Creator, that's worth it all. That is the peace that Jesus brings, the prince of peace. How can we do it? How can we receive that? We receive it by faith, through grace, not because we deserve We cannot do anything to deserve it. We want to. We want to do good things and, and want to do good deeds to somehow get a piece of that, but that's not how it works. It works because he did it all on Calvary. He paid it all on Calvary. He... He gave everything he had. His precious, sinless blood to reconcile us. The handwriting of requirements that was written against us. By the way, we all have it. That's God's list of all our sins. He nailed to the cross. And when he died, he paid it in full. And wrote on it, paid in full. Jesus paid it in full. His sacrifice is what gives us this peace. He's our peace giver despite our circumstances. And then when we find that peace, that helps us find peace around us. But don't expect that it's, everything is going to become completely peaceful when we receive Him because Jesus already said, I didn't come to bring peace. In the sense that our relation with others, I came to bring a sword. In other words, it might get rougher before it gets better. Okay, you hear me, church? It might get rougher before it gets better. He didn't say it was going to be easy. In fact, he said, in this world, you can have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. The peace he gives is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. 
It's the peace that be, it passes all understanding. When we pray and we call on the Prince of Peace, He will give it. And it will defy all our understanding. And then the last description of Jesus is the Messiah who rules with righteousness in all eternity. He rules with righteousness. You know, when we get to heaven, it's all going to make sense to us, beloved. It's all going to make sense to us. Jesus said the kingdom of God is coming. He said it's upon you. His kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, is it growing now? Yes. Did he ask us to pray that it would come to earth? Yes. But he's going to consummate that one day. And after the seven-year period of tribulation, he's going to come back to earth, and we're going to be with him in what's going to happen for a thousand years. Absolute rule and reign on this earth. And the literal thousand-year reign where he will enact his authority and government upon the earth, the Messiah, Jesus, the reigning King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's coming, church. Are you ready? Boy, I'm ready today. Even so, Jesus, Lord Jesus, come quickly. As I was studying for this message, thinking about this, uh, we're in the book of Revelation. By the way, if you haven't, uh, joined us. I want to welcome you to join us on Wednesday night. We're having a marvelous time. Hey, church, are y'all enjoying Wednesday night? Yeah. I sure am. And we're studying the book of Revelation. And in Revelation, we're, we're in the fourth chapter. Uh, we're going to see that uh, Jesus has a prophetic plan for this earth that's going to involve uh, judgments and, and vials and seals, but that He is going to, in the end, those that were martyred for His name's sake will rule and reign with Him. And there's going to be gathered around the throne an innumerable number of people who have given their lives for Jesus, saying, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. There's a worship service in heaven like no other. I was thinking about this when I thought about the True story of a famous composer. I, as you know, in a prior life, I studied music. By the way, we're getting ready for our concert. Pray for us, we're trying. We're going to do it anyway. We're going to have a good time. This composer uh, was commissioned to write a piece in 1741, which he jumped in on. And he uh, uh, took the libretto, which is the text from a, a writer... Uh, Jensen, and he began to study it because he, and, and this text took him straight to the scriptures for inspiration to write this piece, this very well known piece of music. And he got into his uh, study and, and was writing and became totally engrossed in his work. And his house servant in that London house would bring in his meals time after time and knock on the door and slide them in the door and he wouldn't even touch them. Night and day, for 24 days, this composer worked laboriously, writing and composing and studying, almost without sleeping, just napping. And on the 24th day, his house servant knocked. No sound. Knocked again. No sound. And then he cracked open the door, and when he looked in there, he saw the great composer George Friedrich Handel on his knees, lifting his hands up into the sky with tears streaming down his face. And he said, I've just seen the great God himself. He had just finished writing a piece of this music. He had just finished the last notes to the Hallelujah Chorus from the Messiah. And he was reading Revelation 19, verse 6, and he says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, and the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah! He shall reign wherever the sun shall set. He is the head of the church. He is the reason we celebrate Christmas. This is what Christmas is about, church. 
We, there's nothing wrong with giving gifts. We should celebrate. He gave us the greatest gift. But we need to see him this Christmas. We need to look at Jesus. We need to keep our eye on Jesus. In the way of application, I was thinking through this. About this prophecy and about Jesus. About the fulfillment of this prophecy. How Jesus came in 4 B.C. He was born just like the prophet said. This portrait outlines our Lord Jesus Christ. My question to you is, do you believe the prophet Isaiah? That Jesus is the Son of God. He's the wonderful counselor. Do you believe He's God in the flesh? Do you believe He's co-equal with the Father in eternity? Do you believe He rules and reigns forever, linking His kingdom with peace and righteousness, fulfilling the biblical command of sitting on the throne of David? Jesus said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. Do you believe, number one? Then I thought, how can we apply this in our, to our lives? And I, I want to ask this question. Do you need counsel? Then call on the wonderful counselor who will give it to you. Do you need strength and power in your life? Call on the mighty God. When you're too tired to put one foot in front of the other, when you're too sick, call on the mighty God. Call on God, in whom is all power and all strength and all wisdom and all knowledge. Call on Jesus. He will listen and He'll move in your behalf. Do you need a relationship with the Heavenly Father? Do you have a void in your life that's crying out for someone and something to fill it? Then call on the Heavenly Father who loves you. And He alone, who is the Everlasting Father, will fill that void with His redeeming love and grace and Holy Spirit. Now, the next question is, do you need peace in your life? Are you buffeted? Are you upset? Are you uh, disturbed? Are you, uh, is your life breaking into pieces from family conflict? Do you need shalom? Jesus is the prince of shalom. And he will put all the broken pieces back together in your life. He will bring wholeness and completeness through the blood of his cross. And he will reconcile you to the Father through the peace of his cross. And he will fill your heart with that indescribable, incomprehensible, supernatural peace. Of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, it's not just peace. It's love. It's joy. It's goodness. It's gentleness. It's kindness. It's long-suffering. There's nothing that can come against that in your life. It doesn't even matter what's going on around you. What matters is that the Prince of Peace touches your heart with the supernatural love and peace of heaven. True story, there was a woman in Africa some years ago who came to faith in Christ. She heard the gospel and she received it. And she grew in her commitment and devotion to the Lord. She was married. But as often happens, however, she became alienated from her unchurched husband. And over the years, her husband grew to despise and hate her because of her devotion to Christ. His anger... And bitterness. By the way, be careful, little children, for anger and bitterness. Be careful. Satan is gunning for you. He's gunning for his God's children. Let no root of bitterness take root in your soul. Anger and bitterness reached their climax when he decided to kill his wife. Their two children and himself, just unable to live in such a self-inflicted misery any longer. Apparently, God was dealing with him, but he just didn't want to listen. And so he decided he was just going to end it all. But he needed a motive, so he decided he would accuse his wife of stealing his keys. The keys 
that were to his bank account, the keys to his workplace, the keys to his house, and his car, his whole key ring. So early one afternoon, he left his bank job. He headed for the tavern, and his route took him across a footbridge that extended over the headwaters of the Nile River. He paused above the river, and he took his keys, and he looked at them, and he threw them in the water. Then he went to the tavern and spent the afternoon drinking and carousing. Late that evening, his wife went to the fish market to buy the evening meal, and she purchased a large perch which came out of the Nile River. As she was, thought about you, Cody, when I saw you, she was gutting the fish. And you know what she found? True story. In the belly of that fish, her husband's keys. How had they gotten there? What were the circumstances? She didn't know. But she cleaned them up and hung them on the hook on where they belonged. By that time, Pops came in drunk. He beat on the door and said, Water, where are my keys? Already in bed, she got up, picked them up off the hook in the bedroom and handed them to her husband. When he saw the keys, he immediately sobered up. And he fell on his knees right there and said, God, forgive me. I'm a wicked sinner and save me. And he confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He found the Prince of Peace. He found the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. Folks, won't you come to the Prince of Peace? He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Let's bow our heads together. Father, I pray you would bless this time.